The Hebrew Bible has many prophets. In fact, the middle section of the Tanakh is the Nevi'im, the prophets section, even though some of the books in the prophets section are more focused on history, kings, and national politics. But after the book of Kings, you find three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and 12 minor prophets, including Amos, Jonah, Yoel, or Joel, and Malachi. And then the book of Daniel appears near the end of the book. So many, many prophets. And most of those prophets predict doom and gloom for the Israelites. Some promise redemption for a saving remnant, but a dominant theme is that you might think you're doing okay. You might be confident in where you are, but things are going to down, go downhill quickly to disaster. Now, there were probably also, at the time that these prophets were prophesying, there were probably also different kind of prophets. Prophets the kings liked. Prophets that said, yes, sir. They were the yes prophets. They said, everything's fine. The Hebrew God loves you. Don't worry about Babylonia. They're a long ways away. No problem. Now, those yes prophets, the optimists, didn't make it into the Hebrew Bible. That Nevi'im section was probably finalized after Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 BCE. So it didn't make sense to include the yes prophets who had been clearly wrong. And the ones who said, no, no, terrible, terrible disaster, destruction coming, they were right. Optimists needed not apply after the pessimists were correct. Now, what does this have to do with predicting what will happen in 2022? Well, it's hard to go wrong predicting problems. Every year, there are famous people whose work you love who will die. Every year, there are people whose work you hated, they will die. People you know personally will die. People your age, people younger than you will die. Here's a list of 20 names chosen from a collection of famous people who passed away. And as you hear these names, you can think to yourself often one of two things. Wow, I, I can't believe they died. Or wow, I can't believe they were still alive because many of them are in their 90s or even 100. But you can also decide as I read these names and they're from all over walks of life, whether you want to follow the poor model of cheering for the ones you like, and booing the ones you hate. Although in this case, since I'm listing them dead, maybe you want to cheer the ones you didn't like and boo the ones you did. Here are some names of those who passed away in 2021. Larry King, Larry Flint of Hustler Magazine, Rush Limbaugh, Beverly Cleary, the children's author, Eric Carle, the children's illustrator, Bell Hooks, the feminist activist, Cicely Tyson, actor and actress, Christopher Plummer, Jackie Mason, the rabbi turned comic, Ed Asner, the actor turned political activist, Stephen Sondheim, the Broadway composer and lyricist, George Schultz, former Secretary of State, Walter Mondale, ran for president and didn't do so well, Donald Rumsfeld, Colin Powell, Bob Dole, in sports, Tommy Lasorda and Hank Aaron, and in business, Sheldon Adelson and Bernie Madoff. Well, you could boo, you could cheer, but this will happen every year. In fact, we've already seen in 2022 the loss of Sidney Poitier, another wonderful character from the past who is no longer a part of our present. In every year, there will be murder and cancer and car accidents. There will be earthquakes and other natural disasters, which seem to accelerate in 2021. You can see even at the end of the year, the combination of fire and ice in Colorado that was so shocking. There will be government repression. And yes, there will be fatal disease. Some years more than others. And sometimes some of those deaths could have been avoided in a given year even though we know that life itself is a fatal condition. As we review 2021 and look forward to 2022, to avoid the despair of the Hebrew Bible's prophets, I want us to remember the wise words of Rabbi Sherwin Wine that were read in our service. Hope is an act of will, 
affirming in the presence of evil that good things will happen. Optimists laugh even in the dark. They know that hope is a lifestyle, not a guarantee. Now, let me offer the understatement of the year. 2021 did not turn out as we hoped. American COVID deaths totaled 340,000 on January 1st. And by December 31st, the total was 812,000. More died this year than last. In January, our biggest challenge we thought would be getting the vaccines out. Do you remember hunting to find where you could get your shot and driving long distances to take those appointments? Do you remember the people who volunteered to help seniors manage how to do an online sign up, which they couldn't figure out? Remember the gradual freedoms of the newly vaccinated, first seniors and people fudging their age to be older for once so they could get the shot earlier. And then all adults over 18 and then teenagers as well. And finally, kids age five and up. And we should recall that there are still parents out there with toddlers who are not vaccinated. And of course, adults with health issues who are unable to be vaccinated as well. They've never received the freedom that many of us now take for granted. But we learned that after a few months of vaccines, it turned out the bigger challenge was convincing people who did not want the shot. Trump supporting rural conservatives, yes, but also some urban Latinos and African-Americans and young people. These are people who supported Joe Biden for president. One year ago, I predicted this about COVID in 2021. If herd immunity benefits start around 70%, we might start to see some normalcy by the fall, but probably not till the end of the year. And there will be a lot more sickness, stress, and death between now and then. Past performance is no guarantee of future return, but we're at 360,000 deaths and more rising every week. Bob Dylan said, you don't need to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. I don't give myself a lot of points for predicting that COVID would continue to strike us over 2021. It did turn out that vaccination rates sped up more than we had anticipated, and the daily death trend did go down. We had what they called hot vac summer, opening and reconnection. Nationwide deaths were under 500 a day for most of June and July. But now looking back, we know that the UK variant, AKA the alpha variant, and then the Delta variant, and now the South African slash Omicron variant would come roaring back and our lives would constrict again. Today is in some ways the opposite of last January. Last January, we had hope the vaccines are out, we'll eventually get past this. And today, the daily death rate in America holds steady at around 2,000 a day, four times what it was during hot vac summer. We're slowly learning that we are not just going to get over it. We're going to have to get used to it. Maybe the vaccines won't prevent infections like they did at first. Instead, vaccination and boosting will be important to mitigate the infection and the long-term effects if it does hit us. We have to think of 2022 a bit like 1922, the first few years after a deadly epidemic, as they gradually began the transition from influenza to the flu. The flu, by the way, even before COVID was still deadly every year, it cost tens of thousands of lives, but we didn't treat it like influenza like an epidemic, it was part of life. Now, COVID-19 was not just the flu when it arrived in force in 2020, the death rate was almost 100 times higher than the flu, and it is still not yet the flu. We still have concerns about long haul consequences and it's still killing too many people. But our will to hope tells us that eventually we will get used to COVID too. And we'll remember the dark days of the epidemic in the past and not in the present. Now, I could spend all night talking about vaccine mandates and variants and global equity, where some countries are still struggling for their first shots, while other countries are boosting with number three and even number four. We could talk about hospital overload and teacher overload and parent overload and everyone overload. But of course, 
there were other things that happened in 2021 besides COVID-19. We should remember those too. Last year, I began my year in review, which took place shortly after January 6th and the terrible events of that day, with a complicated question. Which January 6th will become the theme of 2021? Will it be the election of a black senator and a Jewish senator from Georgia, which happened that week? Or will it be the barbarians storming the gates of the U.S. Capitol? And in true rabbinic fashion, of course, the correct answer was both of them. The election of those senators has led to the passage of significant legislation and the confirmation of a record number of judges, but it's also led to ongoing political conflict and suspicion as the holdover from that storming of the Capitol, Sus suspicion that the other side is simply the enemy and not just opponents, and the lines get blurred all the time. I saw a wonderful short piece on Saturday Night Live of all places just a few weeks ago that I wanna share that I think explores the complications of uh, telling who is who these days. Hard to tell sometimes. Now, just like early 2020, at the beginning of 2021, Donald Trump was under impeachment, even though he was no longer the president. And just like 2020, he was acquitted by the Senate. Though this time, seven Republicans voted to convict him and bar him from future office. There were actual coups in Myanmar, in Mali, in Sudan, and there were violent political unrest. There was violent political unrest, including uh, arresting democratic opponents in many countries. There was even a presidential assassination in Haiti. These events are all too often off of our radar, but they affect millions of people around the world. And the crisis in American democracy continues with challenges to voting rights and reproductive rights and a general suspicion of those in power, the judiciary or Congress or mega corporations. Now in Israel, unlike 2020, in 2021, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was finally ousted from office in June by an unlikely coalition ranging from religious right-wing settlers to secular right-wing nationalists to leftist liberals to, for the first time, an Arab Islamist party in the governing coalition. And even more amazing, this Frankenstein government managed to pass a budget in November and has not yet fallen apart six months later. Now, like every year in 2021, new phrases entered our vocabulary. We've heard for the first time about Jewish space lasers. The phrase, let's go Brandon. The idea of getting boosted as a good thing, not like your car getting stolen. And breakthrough cases. That's a bad thing. Critical race theory, whatever people think that represents, and the metaverse, and the dangers of the metaverse. And then another moment that I think will live forever. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to uh, uh, take, take We're a trying look. to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the... it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's I'm here live. That's not. I'm not a cat. I can I can see that. Um, I think if you click the up arrow next to this, I am not a cat. Words that will live forever. In the year of 2021, the stocks for GameStop, the value of Bitcoin went on wild rides up and down and up again. Some think the economy is great with everything reopening and wages rising and a billion dollar film in the theaters. Well, people think that the economy is terrible with record short-term inflation and the great resignation and supply chain issues from gas to cars to cream cheese. Your perception may depend on whether your job can be done from anywhere, like an executive who works in the loop, or if you're a cab driver or a restaurant owner who used to serve the people that used to work in the loop. In February, a new NASA rover, Perseverance, landed on Mars, but Texans froze with a massive power system failure during a winter storm. In March, the Suez Canal was blocked 
by a freighter stuck sideways. And the hilarious picture of one little bulldozer and one little backhoe trying to dig out this gigantic freighter gave us a bit of a chuckle. Also in March, Oprah interviewed former Prince Harry and Meghan Markle with a blockbuster scoop that a hereditary monarchy harbored racist ideas. And the next month, Queen Elizabeth's husband of 73 years, Prince Philip died. Coincidence? You be the judge. Over the course of 2021, some prominent issues of police violence, most famously Derek Chauvin versus George Floyd, wound up with convictions that might not have happened without the protests of 2020. Yet Chicago had its worst year for murders in decades, and hyper-liberal New York City elected a police captain, a former police captain as its mayor, in part out of a desire to return to more stability and to counteract these smash and grab mass shopliftings. Kyle Rittenhouse was acquitted in Wisconsin as having acted out of self-defense, but the killers of Jogger Ahmad Arbery were convicted in Georgia and this week were sentenced to life in prison. In April, in Israel, conflicts in Jerusalem over a neighborhood called Sheikh Jarrah and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and Arabs gathering at a gate to the old city in East Jerusalem led to May flare-ups. From Gaza, hundreds of rockets were launched, some coming close to Jerusalem, and there were massive Israeli airstrikes in reprisal. There were protests on the West Bank and there were harsh responses to put down those protests. The crisis in Israel also has accelerated divisions within the American Jewish community. Some 90 rabbinic students from many different seminaries signed a letter publicly opposing Israel's action during the fighting, not even afterwards. Also in April in Israel, there was a massive tragedy during a pilgrimage to a shrine on Mount Meron in the north of the country, where 45 were killed and 150 were injured. But of course, people weren't listening to crowd controls or social distancing or even basic safety precautions. It raised the question in Israel, are the ultra-Orthodox a state within a state? And two months later in June, there would be a governing coalition without ultra-Orthodox parties, which raises all kinds of possibilities of hope for a better future for the non-Orthodox, both in Israel and beyond. In July, the Summer Olympics in Tokyo opened and they went forward mostly without any spectators other than the other athletes. And there were inspiring moments too. There were the two high jumpers that agreed to share the gold medal. And there was that moment when American gymnast Simone Biles pulled out of the competition for her mental health. Even all time great athletes are stressed out at this point. So it's okay to give ourselves some slack too. We also saw over the summer, billionaires Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos launched themselves into space for a few minutes each. Unfortunately, both came back. In August, 2021, even though President Biden had predicted it would not be the case, Kabul, Afghanistan became the new Saigon, complete with helicopters evacuating the US embassy and a frenzied evacuation of our troops and our allies and the chaos of wondering who is left behind and what will happen to them and what will happen especially to those women who were given hope and opportunity in the 20 years since 2001. Hopefully going forward, we can avoid our next classic blunder of getting involved in a land war in Asia for another 45 years. And by the way, again, if it's off your radar, Afghans continue to suffer suicide bombings and an economic collapse and food shortages, even if we're no longer paying attention. And the same thing is happening with the civil war in Ethiopia in their Tigray region. August also saw the fall from grace of New York Governor Andrew Cuomo for sexual harassment, one of the heroes of 2020. And then the truth came out. And we also heard abuse of power stories, making his staffers write his book for his million dollar advance and hiding the deaths in nursing, home, nursing homes from COVID. He also helped take down his brother, Chris Cuomo from CNN when we learned that Chris had proactively volunteered to help with the Cuomo media strategy, even using his journalistic credentials and resources to investigate some of the accusers. There were indeed some sexual harassers and enablers who got their just desserts in ways that might not have happened before the Me Too movement. For example, Jeffrey Epstein associate, Jelaine Maxwell was convicted on December 29th, the very end of the year. This also included the final settlement with USA Gymnastics, over the um, uh, 
Dr. Nasser harassment and, and rape. And even in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish world, an author and therapist named Chaim Valder, who is like the Dr. Seuss of that world, was found to have not only had consensual affairs with adult women, but had forced himself on children, even in a therapeutic setting. Over 20 people testified in rabbinic court before he committed suicide on his son's grave to end the investigation. But just like that collapse of the condo in Sunrise, Florida that happened in June and killed 98 people, even if there are some positives that some people face justice or that they begin to investigate all of those condos that need real investigation and inspection. We know that for the victims, for those 98 killed and their families and for the people who suffered all that abuse, the disaster remains a tragedy, even if we find a silver lining going forward. So what can we expect in 2022? After a 2021 that gave us such high hopes for political recovery and economic recovery and health and social recovery, only to be dashed again and again. Well, to quote the biblical prophet Amos, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son or disciple of a prophet. I do not know what will happen in the fall elections or with economic growth or inflation. As I've said before, if I could predict all of that perfectly accurately, then I wouldn't be doing this. I will say that what we needed in 2021 is what we will also need in 2022. We need to learn how to adjust to the new normal, whatever that turns out to be and whatever it changes to be next. We need to work on improving beyond the new realities, accept new reality and then work to make it different. And we need to have the courage to hope so that we can face those new challenges both alone and together. I wanna end this formal presentation before we open for any discussion or comments with two poems. One poem summarizes 2021, and the second expresses our hope for 2022 in prophetic language. The first one appeared on a website called electoralvote.com. And I turn to that sometimes for interesting analysis and a sort of aggregation of multiple sources. And so I wanna to read to you this poem, uh, didn't have a title, but it makes a nice limerick pattern. When you think about poorly made sequels, this year has few rivals, no equals. Insurrections, near coups, fast mutating flus, it's been more sour than treacle. A gridlock has headlocked the nation. We spend to keep up with inflation. The build better bill up on Capitol Hill is considering self-strangulation. Moreover, I feel deja vu. Fourth wave, are you kidding me, dude? So I still keep my mask on to distance Omicron and worry we're all fully screwed. And yet, some bright spots prevail. Faint billows of fair wind and sail. Vaccines are protecting better than ivermectin. And hey, the Q shaman's in jail. So hip hip hooray and be gone, lamentable two ought to one. I don't pray, but I hope near the end of my rope that this shit show was just a black swan. And then our final poem is one you've probably heard before, but it's worth hearing again. Now, I didn't do what I often do in my year in review and go through some names that were in the news that you might or might not remember. This name was in the news in January of 2021 and came out of nowhere for many people. But when you see the image and you hear the words of Amanda Gorman, it will take you back to that moment at the beginning of last year. Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace in the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president 
only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind-swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid, the new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Well, that's my view of the year that was and of the year that will be and what we need for it.